There were a few what I'll call truths that we put at the center of our thinking and that actually drove our strategic thinking. One was that the, 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 the best value created for shareholders was coming from those that had strong brands and enjoyed strong direct-to-consumer relationships, not relationships disintermediated by wholesale partners. Um, so creating a company and a culture that was back to the, the origins of the Liz Claiborne company, which was all about brand, became our focus. But equally important was that DTC component, being able to pivot the company away from just the wholesale channel to be a true multi-channel retailer, including opening our own retail stores and enjoying a strong presence as a marketer and an, uh, a, a commercial player on the web became central to what we were doing. And with that as well came the realization that we didn't have enough resources to adequately focus on 46 or 47 brands, but we needed to focus on those that had the best possible DTC future. And we also wanted brands that had the potential to go around the world because globalization has definitely impacted the retail world as well. And luckily we had a portfolio of 46 brands to choose from. We spent the next eight years dieting off brands that had potential but not necessarily the kind of returns or cost profiles that we were looking for. In some cases we had to rehab some businesses. We needed to fix their distribution partnerships. We needed stronger designers or better branding. And then we had the opportunity to, to actually sell or outlicense those businesses, aiming to fix our balance sheet so that we could shore that up, so that we had the strong resources that we needed for the few businesses that we ended up taking forward. What we did in the case of both Kate Spade and Lucky Brand Jeans and Juicy Couture, those were the three brands that met the, out of all of the 46 that met the criteria of having high growth potential, of having the attributes of an enduring brand and highly differentiated brand, um, and, and having the ability to go around the world and also what we call multi-category, um, lifestyle brands, not tied to one product category, but could be, that could dimensionalize the, 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 the brand idea across a number of product categories, such as accessories, apparel, home products, and other lifestyle products. And so we chose those three, and we deliberately chose to continue selling in wholesale, but at a dramatically lower level, and, and opening a significant number of retail stores. So in all, all three cases, we opened hundreds of retail stores. We took them around the world, and we built very successful, strong, direct relationships on the web. I think that um, the, the race to the bottom is only getting faster in some ways for the value segment. So I see, I see the middle continuing to what I'll call evaporate. Uh, you know, I see uh, mid-tier priced brands actually competing at a lower and lower level. Um, uh, but I actually see the, the high end actually kind of staying on the course that it's on, which is that it's highly differentiated and there are fewer players in it. The barriers to entry there are very, very high. Um, but I think the biggest trend, if I were gonna call it out today over the course of the next 10 to 15 years, it would be in that whole discussion of media and e-commerce. The penetration of e-commerce, uh, what, what the customer interface looks like, um, both not only with mobile, but, but even with the desktop and the, the merging of, of, of brick and mortar with technology and the role that I think that generally speaking stores aren't going to go away, but I see them getting smaller. There's probably too much square footage out there. Retailers have the opportunity to use technology to make a sale with fewer actual items in the store to sell a broader range of goods in a smaller box. I think this is the trend that I've been seeing and calling out for the last four or five years. 
Um, but you see funny things like Amazon opening stores and, um, and Bonobos opening stores and Warby Parker, you know, digital natives opening stores. They're not going to become big, big time, big box retailers, but that just goes to show that the blurring of the line at the end of the day is a win for the customer. And if we really are, are channel agnostic and follow the customer, I think that those are the trends that you're going to see.